Hi right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chet, episode 445, uh, featuring part two of my interview series with Kevin Saunders. Uh, in this part of the interview, we talk a lot more about Torment Tides of Numenera, as well as uh, the Numenera uh, tabletop game. Uh, we talk about the development of Torment Tides of Numenera, what it was like behind the scenes, a little bit about uh, Kevin's other, one of his other projects called Shattered Galaxy, an MMO. Uh, we talk about the pros and cons of crowdfunding versus just working with a traditional publisher. Uh, we get into that fallout over the, uh, that poll that they did with the turn-based versus the real-time with pause combat in Torment. We also talk about uh, working with Monty Cook uh, versus Wizards of the Coast. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Kevin Saunders. Yeah, one of the things I've kind of wondered about just, you know, as an outsider to all of this is with somebody who has talked to so many de developers and designers. And there was a lot of, I remember if you go back and look at the early interviews, there's a lot of angst, you know, and really I can see on their faces sometimes just this, the, the lingering resentment they have, you know, towards these publishers who didn't really <laughs> get what, you know, I've I heard this many times. They don't understand what fun is. You know, they have no clue. They don't even play these games. You know, a lot of times it's, they're working with people that the people calling the shots are just business types, right? And they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're accountants basically or <laughs> whatever business degrees. <laughs> uh, and I kind of wonder, like, yeah, that's a certain kind of tension there, I guess, between the developer and that sort of authority. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's a different kettle of fish when you're dealing with these backers, people who do know all about the game. You know, they... You know, especially with something like the Torment. So they've all played Planescape uh, Torment, and they really want something like this. I mean, what would be, I guess, what's the lesser of those two evils, <laughs> if you want to phrase it that way? Right. And they, and often they know the game better than you do, even if you worked on it. Oh, <laughs> they yeah. know it better than you do. <laughs> um, it's like all those Star Wars fans that know, like, infinitely more than George Lucas or... You know, who's ever yes. <laughs> holding the reins. <laughs> yes. Well, so first with the publishers, I think that often um, the the antagonism in the developer-publisher relationship is somewhat exaggerated. So yes, the publishers will have requirements, uh, but my experience has been often the reasonable people and if you explain why they want X, but X isn't a good idea, they will maybe reluctantly, but capitulate on on that. Um, you have to choose your battles. You have to fight for the things that are important. Some things they'll want they'll, that, well, you know what? This won't be that hard to do. It won't make the game worse. We'll just do it. And other things where like, this will take work and this will actually be a worse game. And then you persuade them. Mm -hmm. And often you're able to. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are horror stories where you can't. Like there's you know, in any field and then, you know, there are exceptions. Um, but my experience has been um, um, overall that's the, you have, there's definitely energy that's put into working with the publisher. Like you might have one or multiple people whose kind of job is to, to communicate with and manage the publisher. So that's sort of um, an unfortunate necessity from a development perspective because you'd rather those two people be working on the game or have the game cost a little right. less. So, um, but it makes sense, right? I mean, they're investing a bunch of money. They want to know what's going on. They want to be informed, and it's important to communicate with them. That's that, And, and in some cases, you, you're off track in ways that, that um, maybe you're not aware of, and they are. And so there is important feedback that comes in that that you need to, to take into account um like maybe they know there's a risk that they'll have to move up the date a few months and and so when you present some sort of plan to them they're concerned about the risk mitigation in case it needs to be done sooner or or they know if there's on the reverse they know that they could push it out a little longer so if we need more time we could have it and so so there's still there's benefit to it um with the backers, the best part about it, and it's something that Brian Fargo and I'm sure others have, have talked about a lot, is that your customer is your actual, the, the customer, it's the player, it's the same person. Whereas with the publisher, you're kind of your client is the publisher, but really you want to make the players happy. Like as developers, we don't make, we don't get into game development, I think most people, to make a lot of money. 
we get into game development because we like games. We want to. We have ideas for games. We want to share that with other people. We want to help other people like like enjoy games, give them experiences that are meaningful to them. And so, so it's great to have that alignment of the people who gave you the money. The number one thing they want is a good game. And the, now the difficulty is that different people will have different definitions of what that good game is. And depending on how clear your vision has been from the outset, there'll be people who have expectations that, that aren't in line. Um, and one, one area we came across this with Torment is with the combat system, we hadn't evaluated enough to make a commitment as to what the combat we would have in Torment Tides of Numenera. Now, Planescape Torment had a certain type of combat, but also that was really the part of the game that most people thought was the weakest. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, certainly wasn't clear that having that sort of combat was necessary to create that experience. So we felt it was a, a largely open question. And we communicated this during the Kickstarter campaign. Um, but in the end, when we you know, we um, evaluated and then we, we actually did a we, we solicited feedback from the backers on, on turn-based versus real-time combat. Um, and it was a virtual tie. Our internal preference by that time, we had thought turn-based would be better for a variety of reasons. And then we told the backers that. So some accused us of, of biasing the vote. Um, but it wasn't intended to be like a democratic vote, right? It was intended to like, we, we, yes, we're trying to bias you because we think this will make a better game. So we're going to tell you what we think is best. And if you still, you know, vote that you want the other thing, if, if enough people, if it was like 80% in favor uh, and only 20% in favor of the turn based, well, then we would have gone the direction of the backers. But, but really, since we thought turn based was better, um, it would have been nice for us if it was a landslide in that direction. Um, but... Uh, it's it's what we thought was best for the game and to provide the experience we said. But again, some people didn't in in the pages and pages of updates we sent out. Some people missed that part, but like they didn't notice that we didn't talk all about the combat system. They just sort of assumed because I like Planescape Torment and I like that combat. I want that again. They assumed that's what it would be. Um, but there's so much to communicate, and they didn't catch that. Yeah, that reminds me of. When I had way back, and I had Swin Vinka on, he was talking about his uh, the original mm. divinity, divine divinity, and all those. And I remember he was saying at one point that they really wanted to do turn-based combat in those games, uh, but the publisher kept saying, "Well, Diablo is the big thing, you know, action role playing is the big thing, so you have to go with that." So they were forced, you know, to go with that. Basically, of course, it turned out commercially successful. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> so I don't know. I guess no matter how you slice it, you're up against people that have different views about how your game should turn out and then not handling it well <laughs> yes. uh, when they don't get their way. That's what it sounds like to me. I, I think there's, even in, in leading a team, I I really believe in the strength of benevolent dictatorships so i like to have this person on the team is in charge of this system and they get to make the decisions right. and other people can give them feedback and they should solicit feedback and they should consider it but it should be their vision i i dislike design by committee i dislike meetings where like if there's a meeting where we're like just discussing a design early on like that can be productive um but i don't want it so the idea is to be watered down by different opinions in a group. I want one person to be the champion and to love it and really believe in it. Now, if it's if I think it's a mistake, I think I would I reserve the right to veto that. Mm -hmm. But usually that's in the form of trying to persuade them. Um, and I find on, on my teams, I'd say at least 80% of the time, my team member wins. Like the argument. Like I think something maybe should be different. But they convince me in part through their passion of they're, they're closer to the work than I am and they believe in it and if I can see how it all fits together then I want to embrace that and I want to let them realize their vision um, and then it's my responsibility 
to provide the initial constraints so that whatever they come up with within the constraints will work with everything else as much as possible. It's never perfect, but you you know there are adjustments as you go where the the team members still they they still feel ownership of the concept, and I think that's where you get the best work, especially in games where people are very passionate. Um, and so I, I don't want they, they, if we're swayed by the backers too much, then we get this sort of design by committee um, effect. Yeah. We need to listen to them. We want to because we want to make a game they want. And if they're all telling us they want something and it's not what we're doing, then maybe we need to reconsider. Yeah, that must have just been. I, the more I think about it, like what it must have been like from your perspective when that poll came back and it was like. 50 50 i mean that must have just been like oh god anything but this well i think worse would have been so it was 50 50 term-based one but again not in a statistically significant way yeah Um, but i think if it had been real-time one not statistically significant it would have been much harder i'm glad at least term-based one by a little (laughs) so so we can we can still like technically we're doing what the majority voted um, though again, they, we we influence the vote, but that that's our job, kind of. Like, <laughs> yeah, it would have been weird if you. I guess if that had been enough of a landslide the other way, it'd have been like, okay, we would have made it work. Know, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna make this yeah. work, but it would be. I think it'd be kind of hard just not to say, well, you know, but <laughs> we're gonna show you why this was not our choice. <laughs> yes. Like if it was like 60-40 in favor of real-time, or 55-45 in favor of, of the real-time with pause, um, we probably would have felt enough pressure that we had, we'd had we have to do it even though we weren't as confident. And would have, the game would have suffered from that, I, I think. Um, but you do, I mean, little is certain, at least in my mind. I think like others have more strongly held opinions, I think, than I do, but I feel there are many right answers to game design questions, and we just have to find ones that are like ones that are among the right ones. It's not there's not usually an absolute, um, and all of it needs to work together and be internally consistent and be going in the right direction. So as long as we've got that direction well um, established within the team, and then to, to the extent possible to communicate it to the backers. Um, then, then we have a good chance of at least of making, even if it's not exactly what people wanted, an experience that that they'll enjoy. Um, one thing that's great about it, so, and we'll get to this more later, I expect. But earlier in my career, I so it's a game I worked on called Shattered Galaxy. We were it was an MMO RTS. This was very unusual at the time. We were in an open beta for almost a year or so before launch. Uh, and it was wonderful to get be able to get actual feedback on the game and to improve it based on that. So one big plus I see with the crowdfunding is that because you're engaged with the backers, while there's energy involved and while there's the the risk of false expectations and and the community management side, um, you're getting feedback that lets you adjust the game as you go. Whereas m- many of the games I've worked on, we don't know if they'll like it. So we release it and we think it'll be good and meet what people want, uh, but um, you don't even you don't even find out. And then once you find out, it was, it's now too late. It's, it's less true today. There's more like updating games that have been released, um, but earlier you're kind of stuck with the decisions. And if you had known, if you'd gotten some feedback earlier, then you would have better delivered. That's fascinating to me. Was the when was it Pillars 2 where they implemented the turn-based combat like well after? Right. And I thought that, that was really interesting that they would choose to do something like that at this point. Yes. I think one of the challenges with with managing the community is is to filter out the noise, like take it all into account, but not give it, the loud voices carry a lot of weight and to to not let them. 
like to not let them sway. Oh yes, I know it's the right thing to do. I couldn't be more in agreement with you on that point. I mean, it just sickens me sometimes the, the nonsense you see in some of these reviews and on Twitter, and they always these people try to represent. Like, I'm representing the majority. <laughs> like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're like, far out. You know, that is not our... You know, I don't feel like I'm that far out of the norm on this stuff, right? Looking at some of these extreme opinions, just like, where is this coming from? One one thing that, that, that really drove this home for me, so this is also back on Shadow Galaxy. We had a forum in-game. So while you were playing the game, there was, there was a certain time where you're kind of idle and so it's a good time to look at the forum um and we had data on on forum usage so we saw that only about five percent of the players really actively participate in the forum and even our official announcements were only read by i forget but it was like 15 or 20 percent of the players so we made a dramatic experimental change a month or two before launch where we drastically increased the pace of level advancement in the game. And on based on the posts on the forums, it was despised. Now, we also had a feature, this is my favorite feature in the game, I think. We had an exit poll. When you go to exit the game, you get like, like a multiple choice question that was optional. And we had maybe 60% or so compliance with it, like of the players would answer that one quick question. And that, from that, the overwhelming majority loved the changes we made. If we had only listened to the forums, we would have done the wrong thing by our players. And it was only because we had this extra way to reach the people who didn't care about the forums that we that we knew. Yeah, that's that seems to be true just across, just about anything you're talking about, where there's that opportunity. Because you know, there's a certain type of person, I think, that seeks out that type of uh, forum, right, to make, the, make a complaint. They got some kind of axe to grind or whatever. Uh, but the thing that bugs me about those those types is that, you know, again, they, they try to represent themselves like, well, I'm speaking for the majority of your game fans. <laughs> I'm speaking. I get it all, even on Mad Chat sometimes, there'll be some, like, wacky comment. They're, they're trying to make it sound like, well, this is what your viewers think. Like, no, that's what yes. you think. <laughs> well, y- yes, that, that's true. I think, to be, to be fair, I think... That's something that takes a long time to learn, I feel, just as humans, that the things we believe and prefer, though they're so obvious to us, there's many other reasonable people and good people who don't somehow don't share those same beliefs. Uh, I think it takes a long time to learn, and then even once you've learned it, you're still not immune to that that effect. Like you have to actively think about it. At least I find I do. Um, but... But yeah, the, the frustrating part I find is when I've tried early in my career, I tried to engage with those people, and ninety percent of the time, at least, it would turn out to be fruitless, and and uh, spend a lot of energy and not be able to kind of get through to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and even to, sometimes, they, sometimes they convince you know they they, they, they they there's a valid point underneath the complaint. And it's a matter of getting at what the valid point is without right. all the surrounding drama. <laughs> um, like, like, okay, essentially what this person is telling me is they're frustrated about this aspect. What's the real so that, that that makes sense? I can see where that would be frustrating. Their solution would require months of work and major changes, but there's probably some other solution that reduces the frust- that reduces the core frustration enough that actually addresses what they want. I remember talking to a rock band behind the scenes one time, behind the stage or whatever. And this, we're talking about this kind of thing, oddly enough. And the guy was telling me, yeah, this, you're going to get, you're going to, I get all the time people coming up after a show, giving me all this advice and like giving me this feedback, what they like, what they didn't like. And, you know, everything sucks. (laughs) You know, so what I learned after all this time was just look at like how many people are here, how many people stay for the show. You know, because that's what's really telling, right? If they, if, if it really sucked, there just wouldn't be anybody mm, in the audience. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was, I've always kind of clung to that insight. Like, mm. if the show sucked, there would be no viewers. <laughs> Wait, the, <laughs> if the game this, sucked, there would be no players, right? Yes, when, when no one's complaining at all, that's what's scariest. Mm. If you're running, like, an online game. 
<laughs> it's like, people are complaining that they care. They're engaged. It was the times where there was like silence, like, oh, we've broken them. They've given up. Um, you know, this happens some somewhat in um in communicating within a team also like initially until a certain level of, when enough trust is built up you can give very blunt critical feedback and it's taken in the appropriate spirit but until that trust is built up it's easy to derail people or degrade the relationship mm. by, by being too being too blunt. So like, like George and I have worked together on a couple projects and George Zeitz mm. um, talked with whom we've talked recently. And with George, I can just be blunt. I can just say the thing and he's not going to be offended by it. It's a lot quicker and easier to communicate and work together because he, there's enough background that he also knows what I mean. That isn't, you know, maybe if I didn't choose exactly the right words, he, he know he knows, what I'm getting at or knows enough to ask a, a follow-up question instead of taking information and, and, and running in, in a, in a strange direction. That's not what I meant. Um, you learn people's communication patterns and you develop a trust that's really important. And with the players, like there's no trust there yet, or there's little trust, you know, based upon maybe what you've worked on in the past, there might be some, um, uh, but it makes the communication a, dip, a lot more difficult. And there's so many, like, it's not really possible to, or it's very hard to establish that kind of relationship with with the players of your game. Let's get into a little bit more about Tournament Tides of Numenera. Uh, so the one of the goals, I was going back and looking at some of the early interviews, those are always fun. I love to look at the interviews yes. like before something comes out and think, <laughs> like, okay, what happened? What you know, what was going on there? It's very revealing. Uh, but anyway, there was this uh, goal to, quote, capture the vibe and the style of the Planescape original. And, of course, I'm pretty sure most people watching this have probably played both <laughs> both games, yes. right? Uh, so, of course, that earlier game set in the uh, Planescape campaign setting. And the new one set in Numenera, you know, different setting. So I was reading, I was kind of wondering, like, what I, I know a little bit about it like basically this is what i've heard was well there was going to be another it was going to be set in the planescape setting originally but something happened some some kind of negotiations broke down i've never been clear on like what what those were so i'm kind of curious if you could shed any light on that uh and then also what i'm curious though really what i'm curious about is if it had been a planescape game mm -hmm. would it have been fundamentally different so yes, it, it, I think it would have been. Now, from a development perspective, actually, um, I I thought Numenera was a better would be better for the project, um, and the reasons are so. I had worked with Wizards of the Coast on the Neverwinter Nights two games, and they were good to work with. We the, there were there were some things, but very few things where we wanted to do something and it was problematic. So it's not that they were a difficult licensor. Um, but with Monty Cook, it, here we have a, I have a direct line. I have on my phone, I can just call the owner of the IP and the company, and he can give me an answer on any decision right then. And he's personally invested in our success in a way, someone you know working at Wizards who is a decade removed from the Planescape setting you know, here's a guy who ha he has all the answers, and if he doesn't have it, he can decide, he can make it up right then. Um, and so that's a huge benefit uh, in terms of of developing um, the IP and being true to the setting. I think it's very important when you're, I want to be consistent with the setting. I want to, I want to honor the goals of the setting because a lot of thought went into that and um, to, to to veer off track is um, like a, to do something that doesn't work with the setting. You're you're throwing away good work that was done to develop it and the thought that went involved. Um, and so uh, another reason it would be very different. So getting back to the expectations, if it were in Planescape, then some people would want it to be really a sequel. 
then they'd want the nameless one to return, or at least in some way. And others would want not that, because that story was complete and great and don't ruin it. And and some people might be in between. Maybe he should have a cameo. But like whatever we did on that yeah. spectrum, there would be a, a significant percentage, I think, that would not have liked that choice. The expectations would have been much more specific and harder to meet because lots of people love the game but not all for the same exact reasons now being in a different setting nameless one isn't going to show up not even nothing to worry about like uh we're free to create an experience that captures the type of experience that planescape torment did um but without that that added challenge so i think the game would have overall been it would have been much harder to uh, think of it would have been much more disappointment in the end if it had been in Planescape. Was there any discussion of just creating an, a unique or original setting, sort of an in-house solution? Not really, not really because of the extra effort that would be involved with that. And one thing that was especially appealing about, I mean, Monty Cook was one of the people who was involved in Planescape setting. And here is a new setting he's making to a crowdfunding campaign. He crowdfunded Numenera. So it like felt... The Sarah felt Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and Monty and Colin had worked had worked together before. I mean, Colin and also, Colin McComb also obviously worked on the Planescape setting. So we had two of the three main architects of that setting involved in this project. Um, but Monty had already spent months and months of work in this developing the setting. So we didn't have to. Um, similarly with adapting the game systems, like again, here are systems that, um, a lot of thought had gone into. And to me, it felt fairly compared to Dungeons and Dragons, um, fairly straightforward to, like, easier to interpret into a computer game than Dungeons and Dragons was. Um, I love, I, I love Dungeons and Dragons and have played a lot of tabletop and also computer games based in it. But especially the earlier editions, it, it, it was hard to adapt because of the technical realities. Mm -hmm. um, and here with Human Era, it was it seemed like it it could su be supported well. And again, then we didn't have to we didn't have to come up with things from scratch. Like the, there's there's these there's these three attributes, so we don't have to. It's not we don't have a debate on the team whether it should be five or six or or three or whatever. Yep. It's it's this way. We have a starting place. Now, if in the development we come across a reason that we need to make an adjustment, then we talk to Monty about it and say, hey, how important is this part to you? And sometimes it'd be very important. No, that's, that's, that's crucial, though. Often when it was crucial, we knew not to ask because we already sort of, like, obviously. <laughs> like this, what, what, what's an example of something that you... Would so one, uh, one is... Um, in the Numenera setting, it's so it's in the the very very far future, like unrecognizable, but um, but Earth, and the people are all more um, like the, the the average person is more a uh, mixed race, um, so more like a like a not not Caucasian, some somewhere darker, mm -hmm. um, and it's not. Um, very explicit about that, but the idea is that there's been enough like interbreeding across people for currently different races, and it's, it's so far in the future um, that that's the way that's the way people would tend to look. And and Monty had made a point to us earlier that with the Numenera core book, he was not fully pleased with how Caucasian a lot of the characters looked in it. So he was saying like this is not really representative. Like we had to make a book and these pictures were, you know, these characters were good, but this isn't really what I, what I was looking for. So sort of, we knew that. So as we were getting back concepts that were too Caucasian, maybe we were more in that direction. We already had input from him as to where he wanted things to be. Um, and I, that's a, that's a case where we should be, I feel we should be true to the world. He, he has his reasons for wanting it this way and there's no, clear reason to not do that except for the fact that it seemed to be challenging to communicate to artists necessarily mm. and also for that example it was somewhat slightly problematic that again the Numenera core book 
didn't quite match what his ideal vision was because it's not like there's a disclaimer in the book that says that. So people are looking at the book and say, oh, this is how people look in this world. And, and, and so they don't. Yeah, how many times have you read read a book and you look back at the cover art and like that doesn't match? <laughs> Didn't the artist even read the book? <laughs> yes, probably not, right? And there were some cases where um, I found that actually I was a harsher um, adherent to the universe than Monty would be. Really, like, there'd be something where I'd say we we need to change this. This doesn't. I don't think this works. But then the team would would resist like someone would say well, well it's going to take like a week to change that in the way you're saying so okay so that even if it's not right that we don't want to spend that that'd be a waste of time so i'll ask monty i'll ask monty and he, oh sure that's fine um and so something that concerned me to be up being consistent he was more more lax on um, yeah, he sounds like a great guy to work with really he, he yeah he, he he was he was on this um there wasn't anything that upset him, or he's like, "No way! What are you? You guys are crazy." That's you know. I don't recall anything like that. I mean, I think part was we had the goal of faithfully portraying his setting and his his ideas, and so I think I mean he definitely had feedback on things, but often the feedback was of the or on the order of like, it would be better if it were this way, but it's okay if you don't change it. And so then in those cases, we would change it if it wasn't a big investment of work. But if it was a, a lot of work, we'd say, well, is it OK that you know, we don't make that change because of the cost? And you say, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then it sort of helps calibrate us for the future. Like now, OK, that type of thing, we're learning what's important and what's not as we go. And, and so over time, it became easier to get it right the first time. I mean, is he happy with the way things turned out? I don't know. Um, so I I left Torment after less than a year into production, and I don't know much about af about about the the what happened after. Um, in part because I guess it, I felt it's not really appropriate for me to to like ask Monty that. Um, <laughs> And also, I I had invested a lot of myself into Torment, and to be honest, I I can't bring myself to play it. Hmm. Uh, it was kind of um, a heartbreaking experience for me, and and I I, I you know I've I've heard some of the feedback, um, but I haven't sought it out because I. I I knew what my plans were. I don't know what happened after I left. I was going to ask you what you, you know, what you thought about it, but I mean, I or like some of the criticisms I, of it, maybe. But I think others have already spoken to that, and they would know better than me because I, I don't know. I know where it was at at the time I left, and I knew what my plans were at that time. Though, as I as I said earlier. Things still adapt over time, so I'm sure what I had planned was going to morph further throughout development had I had I stayed. Um, what I can say is, I, I mean, I had a lot of faith and confidence in the team. Um, about a third of the team I had recruited from my past were past colleagues of mine, people like George Zeitz, and about another third were people that I hired, made the hiring decision on, and so I felt confident that that the project was in good hands um there were challenges like there always are and 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 there's always also curveballs that you get that that they, you you attempt to manage the risk as much as you can but still things will happen that you weren't expecting i, mean, I guess an uh, obvious example so for my current employer embodied I was put in charge of our natural language processing group, which was one of the larger divisions. It's a small company. Um, and two months later, I'm off for nine months or, or eight months mm -hmm. for health reasons. So that's not a curveball that anyone anticipated. But you have to figure out how to adjust to those realities and, and make, the, make the product as successful as possible anyway. 
Um, and so I don't know what curveballs came came after I left. Um, but I I I'm very confident in the the motivations of of the team, and I I know they they all would have done whatever they thought was best for the product at the time. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back uh, next week with a third part. I'll probably do uh, four installments here with Kevin. I think I got enough uh, footage to uh, for that, so stay tuned. A lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, the best is yet to come. And as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much from the absolute lowest level of the dungeon of my heart for your uh, kind support and continued support of my show, Matt Chat. Uh, I couldn't, would not do it without you. Uh, so if for whatever reason you have been uh, waiting, you know, waiting for that perfect moment to step up to the plate and do your part, uh, just take a minute, go ahead and take care of that. I think you'll really enjoy the uh, the Patreon site. Painless, easy to set up. All I'm asking is a one buck per episode uh, for this content. So, if, you know, if you think the show is worth that to you, please uh, go ahead and sign up for the uh, Patreon site. I know you will like the show even more if you support it. So thank you, uh, folks, for that. Now, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, quite a bit of news uh, this week. Uh, of course, a lot of it is related to the uh, uh, the pandemic that's got everybody locked down. A lot of articles along the lines of, you know, games to play and so on and so forth. Uh, I assume you probably have uh, plenty of ideas. Uh, there are a couple things I wanted to talk about, though. One is an uh, IGN's article. This is by Seth Macy and John, oh, and John uh, uh, Ryan. Everything you need to play D&D from the comfort of your home. Uh, so this is more an article for people that play uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or whatever in a tabletop version, looking at maybe uh, transitioning to some kind of temporary uh, online solution. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, products out there, but the one they recommend and I concur with is uh, Roll20. And so I have played with this quite a bit myself. I'm far from a master of it, but I just say it works well. It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm impressed with the creativity of what DMs can do with that uh, software. So it's a lot better, in my opinion, than just trying to do something on uh, Zoom or uh, Skype or something. So check out this Roll20 product in this article. Now, one thing I did not know about Roll20 until I read this article was that it uh, uh, has support for a lot of other games, uh, Pathfinder, Starfinder, Cyberpunk, and older uh, D&D, including AD&D. Uh, so that sounds like uh, a lot of fun. I haven't really explored that <laughs> Roll20 as much as I probably should. Um, anyway, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. If you're somebody that's been playing, uh, like me, uh, regular sessions of a tabletop D&D, are you doing something like Roll20 now? Uh, or are you just meeting? Uh, to heck with it, you know. Uh, let me know what, what you're doing. I'd like to hear that. Uh, and then also uh, along these lines, uh, Lord of the Rings Online and D&D Online, I think Shane and a couple other people posted about this, uh, they are making that free, freely available now. For some reason I thought it was already free. <laughs> uh, but I guess now it's temporarily free anyway. Uh, the content will remain free until April 30th. And so along with the free content, they'll be hosting some extra events and some other things. Now, ostensibly, they didn't, they didn't say anything in there about the uh, the virus doing this because of the pandemic, but uh, that seems to be the implication there. Now, you know, I'm kind of curious if uh, World of Warcraft will go free uh, during this. We'll have to, to see. I kind of doubt it. Uh, and then let's see. Uh, other news. This is kind of a little, I don't know, uh, slip up, I guess, at Bethesda. Uh, so they... Uh, got this new Doom Eternal game, and they have this copy protection scheme, De Nuvo, and apparently they did <laughs> some, uh, they messed up somehow and released a version or released a file anyway. There's some kind of workaround that people have discovered uh, to get rid of this uh, copy protection, 
And so I don't normally get into this kind of stuff, but I just thought it was interesting, this article from, uh, let's see, West Finland. West Finland points out that a lot of the people that want something like this, it isn't because they're pirates and they want to get it for free, but it's just they don't want the, uh, uh, the performance hit of that copy protection on the games that they, they purchase. So I thought that was an interesting uh, take on that. You know, I always felt like uh, stuff like this De Nuvo and the DRM, it always seems to just screw the people that actually buy the games. Uh, it hurts them more than it does. You know, the pirates are going to get the game regardless. Uh, so you're just kind of sticking it to your own uh, fans with, with something like that. At least that's my opinion, ignorant as it may be. <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, I just uh, thought this was kind of cool. I was on Kickstarter looking for new games and things as I want to do. And I came across this as a Dark Souls The Collection ring. It's actually a set of rings, handmade jewelry made of sterling silver, wearable, and collectible rings from uh, uh, Dark Souls. This is by an artist named Ellie, or Eli, I think it's probably Ellie, a jeweler located in Girona, or Girona, Spain. Sorry about the pronunciation. Anyways, she comes from Spain, folks. Uh, so she's been making jewelry for a long time, I suppose, and then decided that it was time to branch out into anime and video games. So it's not really that expensive either. It's uh, $76 to get one of these rings and pledge to it. I think there's a couple deals where you get more rings for, you know, uh, you get like two rings, a little bit cheaper, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, I just thought these were some pretty cool rings. Even if you're not really into Dark Souls, you might enjoy these. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking out for quotes, um, you know, about all sorts of things, but I came across this one by Jonas Salk. Uh, if you don't know that name, it might be tickling some synapses in your brain. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Salk is the guy who discovered and developed the uh, first successful polio vaccine. Uh, so kind of a timely quotation from him. But anyway, listen to this quote. I think this is great. It goes something like this. I have had dreams and I have had nightmares, but I have conquered my nightmares because of my dreams. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Why is it so important that you want to contact the governments of our Earth? Because of death. Because all you of Earth are idiots!